You're watching Your Mental Health, a Bay Area Conversation. We've now developed a certain set of habits for over a year. I mean, you just got to get used to it again. Constant adjustment. I think that's the whole pandemic, right? No sports, no activities, no peers. They've missed a year of social connection. And so there's a lot of question about where do I fit in? It's like, where are we with regard to the rules? You're safe at home. You can control what's happening in your house. When you have to re-enter, you're no longer in have that bubble around you anymore. COVID has been like swimming in a pool of unknown, in an ocean of the unknown. Good afternoon. Thanks for being there. I'm Reggie Aki. And I'm Kate Larson. We are live here on ABC7, Hulu Live, and wherever you stream. Today, instead of our usual 4 p.m. newscast, we are going to spend an hour with experts and you in conversation about your mental health. The emotional long haul of the pandemic is still taking a toll more than a year later. A survey from the American Psychological Association found that 49% of adults are uncomfortable about returning to in-person interactions when the pandemic ends, even with vaccinations. The reasons are complicated, but uncertainty about the future, stress and social anxiety are definitely playing a part. One study finds that more than 10% of people met the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder after going back to work. Yet despite this, 30% still say society does not view mental health as a part of a person's overall health. And today is Mental Health Action Day, and we're going to help you take action, joining us a panel of top experts in the field from the Bay Area. We're going to start with Dr. Stuart Butler, Regional Director of Behavioral Health at Kaiser Permanente. Dr. Christine Garcia, Regional Director with Edgewood Center, which specializes in helping children and families who have experienced trauma. Dr. Margaret Lamar, Associate Professor at Palo Alto University, specializes in maternal mental health. Psychologist Dr. Nia Sanders is also joining us. And Mark Salazar, Executive Director with the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. We just heard some interviews with Bay Area residents who are uncertain even after being vaccinated. So it's important to note that getting back to some form of normal isn't as easy as flipping a switch. Dr. Garcia, we'd like to start with you. What are some of the biggest concerns people have as we begin to sort of ease out of this acute phase of the pandemic? I think uh, the biggest concern for a lot of people is safety. So how safe is it to go back? How safe is it to go back and deal with childcare when schools are hybrid or pandemic issues um, arise out of the blue if suddenly your kid has to go home because there might be a COVID positive person in their classroom? I think people are quite nervous about venturing out, returning to work, returning back in person as so many unknowns are still in front of us and we don't know how to plan and how to make everything work as they used to do prior to COVID. Dr. Lamar, maybe you can jump in here and just jumping off of what was just said, what's something that we can do to try and ease our nerves a little bit as we step our foot back into the deep end? Yeah, that's such a great question. It's so challenging. I think, um, you know, one thing that I encourage folks to do is really focusing in on what are the things you have control over mm. and allowing mm -hmm. yourself to really focus in on those things and try to let go of the things you can't control, right? Um, which is really challenging to do. Um, but, Dr. you know, Lamar, if we can what say, do I have well, control over? I'm spinning, I'm spinning. <laughs> Well, right. It feels like um, that's the challenging part, right? Because it it it, it normal feels like a moving target. Uh, it feels like we don't know what's going to look you know, what things are going to look like in two weeks or in the fall when our kids go back to school. So it is really challenging to feel like we're in control. But if I can say, you know, okay, I know what we are going to do for this next couple of weeks, like, or I know what I can do today, or, you know, of the things that, you know, we're engaging in, here are the pieces that I can control. I can wear my mask and I can wash my hands and, you know, I can, you know, be mindful of the people that we're around and kind of keep our social circle really tight. Um, you know, those kinds of things might help folks feel a little less anxious about all of you know, the, the sort of quote unquote normal that we're returning into. But Dr. Lamar and maybe Dr. Butler can take this question. 
We've created new patterns for the past 15 months. We've created certainty in our isolation and our masking habits and our hand sanitizing. So what about June 15th when things start to reopen? The concern is that those habits have to change again. So how do we move through this next step safely and also ease those mental health fears and anxieties? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think about where we are right now is, uh, you know, we're in in a storm, but in different boats. Uh, and we're experiencing things quite differently because of our, our personal circumstances. So, you know, one size is not gonna fit everybody. It's really important, I think, for people to move more slowly back into their lives. Uh, we don't have to rush it. This isn't a sprint. Uh, we're in a marathon, frankly. And, you know, what I tell people to do is decide on the two or three things you really enjoy doing visiting friends, uh, you know, who've been vaccinated. Uh, if you enjoy eating out, going to a movie, taking a drive, exercising, going shopping, do two or three things slowly uh, and safely. Don't push yourself or press things. You know, we're, you know, going back to some people have lost relatives, close friends, and others have fought the disease themselves and may have lingering symptoms. So not everyone is ready to jump back into their previously considered normal life. Uh, I think life is not normal uh, and is not gonna be normal for some time. So really we do need to move more slowly. I've also, uh, you know, our partners, our relationships, we may not be in the same place with the people who we live with and love. So it's very important, I think, to also manage our relationships in a way that we, we may neither of us may not uh, be ready uh, to do things. So it, it's important to uh, have a relationship with our partner and make decisions about how we're going to ease back into this together. Uh, so I think those are some of the things I think about. Dr. Saunders, Dr. I have Saunders. a very capable, very capable and smart capable colleague and smart. named Javina Fortson, and she's very well aware of the science. We talk about these issues every day. We talk to doctors. She's been vaccinated, but she, and she allowed me to share this with everybody, she's very nervous about this next step, about going into a store soon in just a few weeks and not having a mask on and the person behind the, the counter perhaps not wearing a mask. And moving into that sort of new normal, she has a lot of anxiety about it. And I'm I'm wondering if there is an identity that we have created over the past year plus where we see ourselves as good actors by having the mask and by socially distancing and that we care about other people and, and those things are very attached to that. So when you take that away, it kind of makes us feel like perhaps we're not good actors anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a part of this that has become so politicized, right? That it really means something like a, a simple mask becomes a message about what your values and what your beliefs are. And I think that a lot of people have had to navigate that even within their families. When one family member decides not to, or people decide not to get vaccinated for the reasons that they have, it's a very personal decision, but it is also very public facing when we're navigating in our communities, right? And so I think I, I go back to my fellow colleagues here, the comments about Christine's comment about safety and Stuart's comment about slowing down is that what feels right for one person is gonna feel different for someone else. And it's okay. I think part of what the conversation around anxiety is, is how do we get rid of it? And I think the first step before we can get rid of it is to acknowledge that it makes sense to be anxious. It makes sense to be stressed about going back and even the idea of things opening back up is really scary. It, it was an adjustment to shelter in place and working from home and it took some time and it's gonna be an adjustment to revert back. And so taking the time and giving ourselves grace in that process and for the people in our lives as well. Mark, I'm curious what you think. I was just reflecting back on our mental health town hall a year ago that Reggie and I were a part of. And a year ago, it felt different because there were so, so many unknown questions about what COVID was and people were getting sick and people were dying. Many of us are now vaccinated. We do seem to be on the up and up despite so many lingering mental health concerns. What are you hearing in your community about mental health? And do you feel that we can now start to move forward in a more positive direction? So, yeah, um, I think 
since we started, you know, when we went to the, the pandemic, the biggest questions we had or the biggest concerns we got from our callers um, was about what COVID-19 was, uh, ending around anxiety and, and panic and isolation. And that's still the most common topics that people call us about. And, you know, we roughly take about 9,000 calls a month and those are the most common topics. Um, it's that fear of returning to normal, whatever that is for anyone else. And so that's kind of been the expression around the community and the people we serve. It's, um, you know, is it safe to go into clinics? Is it safe to provide or receive one-to-one -one peer support or counseling or therapists in person, even support groups? Um, our virtual telemedicine stuff or tele uh, peer support stuff has accidentally increased um, over the past nine months or so but again that that topic is always anxiety and having that one one in-person kind of interface is still a difficult uh, uh challenge for a lot of people dr garcia i was just talking to a friend of mine uh recently and he was telling me that during pandemic times his friend circle has essentially disintegrated people he really depended mm -hmm. on to be there and be a part of his group they're just no longer there. Things have really changed. Relationships that you thought were a part of your core aren't, and things have been shaken up. And I think that there's, there's you know, kind of two things happening. People are a little bit anxious about hanging out with people again that they haven't seen in a long time, but also they're aware that, that those relationships may not be there anymore. And I'm wondering about that social anxiety. I think that's very common. Uh, in fact, in my own life, my friendships and, and relationships have shifted in this past year. And it's been interesting who's kind of uh, surfaced in, in my life and who's kind of receded and how things have really flowed through. Um, I think you have to have first compassion and understanding for what's happened to people and how this has really created some, a, a little bit of social anxiety for all of us. Uh, I know that even when I go into a supermarket and I see more people, I get a little a little taken aback and nervous and hanging out with people. People have very different um, ideas of what is okay or not okay for them to do right now. And I think we have to be ourselves okay with that and allow for that. Um, is I it think weird, Dr. Garcia? Missing, uh, is oh, it weird to say yeah. it's just, is it weird to have a conversation or is it healthy to have a conversation with a friend that you've kind of lost touch with or you're not really sure where you are anymore with them to say, hey, are we still good? <laughs> Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. that's the whole key to communication, right? Is hey, are you are are we okay? I have a friend who's very strict with her um, COVID restrictions and I'm dying to see her. Um, but we haven't been able to see each other and that's okay, you know, and I've done something like that. So absolutely reach out and connect with people and put yourself out there um, with what you need too. And in and, and that way you can have an understanding. And I think this is important too for couples, for people in relationships where you've been in this hot house of a, of a home, so to speak, and relationships have gotten quite intense for people. It's important to start that communication of what do you need now and mm. to keep those lines of communication open. I'm writing yeah. that one down. Seriously, what this has already been such now? a great start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already feeling more mentally fit. All right, we're going to take a quick break on air, but the conversation continues right now on Facebook and YouTube. And you can be a part of this ABC7 Listens conversation as well. Go to Facebook or YouTube to weigh in and interact with our panel of experts. As we go to break, we're going to continue talking. Okay, we are still online with our panel of experts. Thanks for so much for sticking with us. I do wanna sort of jump off on what we were talking about, all about all of those personal relationships that we have. I know my own sister has been very locked down and only since she's been fully vaccinated have we really gotten to spend more time together and I can see my nephew. I, Dr. Garcia, like you, one of my oldest friend, I have not seen her since this entire pandemic. We've only Zoomed and she lives about six blocks away. What kind of things can we say or what kind of conversations can we have with those people in our lives who are really scared? Is it healthy for us to say things to help them sort of bring them out of their isolation and shell or do people sort of need to move through this on their own terms? 
curious what, what the other um, folks here on this panel think, but I think it's a little bit of both of seeing, you know, how people move through, but also asking them, what are you okay with? And, and, and what can we do here? I miss you. And put your, your vulnerability out there and your curiosity about how can, how can we see each other? Is, is, is FaceTime going to be how much we can do for a little while? Is that the most you can do right now? Okay. What, can I check in with you in a few weeks? Uh, those kinds of things. I don't know what other folks have to say here. I just love what you said about having empathy and understanding because we don't ever know fully know what someone else is going through and what their experiences are and why they may not be, you know, wanting to, you know, not get together. It could be something that has nothing to do with the things that we think. And I, I was also really thinking too about how we can apply this for our children, children and adolescents as well, helping them navigate those conversations, I think is so important, um, especially because you know, I ha ha see a lot of younger children and seeing them try to sort of relearn how to socialize has been really interesting. Um, and so helping them navigate that process, helping adolescents navigate that. I mean, they also have the same anxieties and worries about, um, you know, being back with friends. It may be more about who, you know, who am I still friends with um, if they're younger or they may also have still have health and safety concerns, um, but I think navigating those conversations with younger yeah. kids is really important as well. Dr. Saunders, yeah, I wanted to ask Dr. Saunders, I also want to acknowledge we have less than a minute till we go back on TV, but there's so many people who are essential workers that have been working in person this whole time. So somehow acknowledging that they're a part of this conversation too and that their mental health is affected and that they may have experienced real trauma the past 15 months. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. critical. People have, yeah, people have been going through very different experiences. You know, some people are employed, many people are unemployed. Yeah. Uh, the whole issue of food insecurity has been a, a, a big issue with people who are more impoverished. So I, I do think, you know, as we're reaching out to people who we haven't connected with for a yes. while, we really need to find out where they are. Okay, uh, thanks. And not just Thank you so much for finishing your thoughts. We're gonna go back on TV in about five, six seconds. So we're gonna continue this conversation on air and then we'll be back online for our next. You're watching Your Mental Health, a Bay Area conversation. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we're looking at the psychological impact of the past year on all of us. Of course, there's a pandemic, but there's also the impact of police violence against citizens and citizens against citizens. So much over the past year to dig through. And of course, for people of color, it's been especially traumatizing because there are multiple things happening all at once. So I wanna bring Dr. Saunders into this conversation again to talk to us about what it's been like uh, as we especially talk with the black community and now here in Asian American Pacific Islander month, we are seeing this incredible violence against Asian Americans throughout the country. This is a lot for anyone to deal with, but particularly at this time. Yeah, there's been a significant rise in folks who are looking for therapists who are specifically specializing in racial trauma because there's so much fear about safety. There's a lot of hypervigilance, um, not just related to COVID, but also around navigating the community as a person of color and not feeling safe, just walking the streets um, in terms of feeling as if, or getting the message that you can be criminalized, that you can be attacked because of your ethnic background. And so folks are holding a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety and anger, um, which they're looking for a place to be able to process those emotions. Is there a place where we can start, Dr. Saunders, if we have a friend or a colleague who is a part of one of these communities that has been especially traumatized over the past year in order to reach out, but not have expectations that would just further traumatize them? Yeah, I think it's important that if you're wanting to have this conversation that you can acknowledge what's happening, right? Because I think what can be so painful is when there's something happening and no one's talking about it, right? Or it's just continue going to work, it's business as usual, going to school, 
and there's no larger conversation about the violence that's happening, both for the African American community, also for Asian American communities and other folks of color. And so I think the first part is to be able to create that space and really a way to have that be a safe conversation is to listen, right? If this isn't something that you've experienced personally, then it's important to listen to the folks who are the most marginalized and those are the ones who are being harmed. I'd like to also bring in uh, Mark Salazar into this conversation. Uh, we both have a background in Hawaii, and so I know that you're very well versed in people who come from uh, a multi-ethnic society, and so there, there are a lot of folks who are really feeling that right now as we're trying to both honor those cultures but also protect them. So I'm wondering what you're hearing within the Bay Area about that. Yeah, and I mean, just dovetailing on Dr. Saunders, it's it's really just acknowledging it um, as an executive. One of the, the first roles that we have is making sure that we acknowledge the traumas and challenges uh, that our team's going through. And, and so at MHSF, uh, that's the, the, the pinnacle of everything that we do. It's acknowledging it and talking about it and holding that space. Uh, like you said, as, as someone from Hawaii, this type of violence to me is is really unreal and it's really challenging as as someone who comes from you know a place where everyone typically gets along you know no matter your race creed or ethnicity it's it's a place of paradise then when you come to situations of you know the, these racial violence stuff it, it's really challenging and and jarring at the same time and a lot of people uh, have no way to cope around that because they've never experienced it and you know the the racial um uh, injustice that people feel every day just by being, you know, a black person or an Asian person is, is really traumatizing. And so I think acknowledging it at the executive level and making sure that you're, you support your team around having that discussion, uh, providing opportunities like healing circles, or even just um, acknowledging safety uh, as someone walks through the streets is, is just an easy, simple step that you could do. And this is for anyone who wants to jump in. How important is it to get a culturally competent therapist if that's what you're looking for? I think it's super important, but I would challenge the idea that you arrive at competence because I think that's something that's continuously developing. What I think is important for folks who are looking for a therapist is that there's a goodness of fit, right? And so they're assessing the therapist and you might even ask a therapist, how do you approach issues of race and ethnicity and culture? How do you integrate those into treatment? And listen for what the therapist responds to that because you'll get a sense of whether that's a conversation that's welcome into the therapy room. You know, because sometimes people come in and they're like, oh, why am I talking about this? You know, this doesn't belong in my therapy. And I'm like, wait, what? This is affecting your mental health. We need to talk about this and really wanting them to feel welcome to talk about those things. Well, and speaking of with... competent, we have to talk about women and mothers. Uh, switching mm -hmm. gears a bit, women carried a heavy burden during the pandemic with about 44% saying they were the sole provider of care for their children compared with 14% of men. According to the National Law Center, women have lost more than 5 million jobs since February 2020. Black, Latina, and single moms have, of course, been hit the hardest. Dr. Lamar, I know you completed a study on the early impact the pandemic had on parents what did you discover through that? Yeah, we found a significant um, impact on the mental health of parents, both mothers and fathers. Um, you know, we were looking at parents last April and it was really rough. And, you know, we saw a lot of uh, really heightened, high, severe and extremely severe levels of stress, anxiety and depression. Um, and, you know, I think if we think back to that time, that makes a lot of sense. It was really, everything was really challenging. We were at home, daycares, schools were closed, not a lot of support. Uh, we were really just, you know, swimming in the deep end, right? Um, but I think what we've seen is, you know, that heightened anxiety and depression and stress that we saw maybe felt like hypervigilance, having a hard time sleeping, just day-to-day -day functioning was really challenging. I don't think we're seeing much, we're seeing somewhat lower levels of anxiety and depression now, um, but it looks a lot different. So I think, you know, mo moms and parents, but mothers, um, especially are 
feeling this level of burnout that feels unprecedented. Um, and it looks different. It maybe feels different than it did 12 months ago. Um, maybe it feels like being tired or not having a lot of motivation or just overwhelmed and just kind of waiting for you know school to be out or the summer to be here, or maybe you're dreading the summer to be here. I don't know. But it it, it has morphed into, into something else that looks different, but it's still really concerning in terms of mental health. Well, and the other hard part about being a parent and often more so for moms is that you never have time to recover, right? You may have had a tough day at work and now you have to come home and deal with screaming toddlers or cranky teenagers. What can mothers, fathers, any parent do to sort of find that time in their day to take a breath? The panel is yeah. open to anyone who wants to answer. One of the things we've been we look at a lot with moms is is really just lowering expectations. There's really high expectations on mothers just socially before even before COVID. You know, moms keep the calendar and they provide a lot of emotional support. They do a lot of the emotional labor. Um, you know, they take care of a lot of the housework and you know home responsibilities, all the domestic labor. Um, and so I think one thing we can do is just lower our expectations for ourselves and for each other, um, that we don't have to do the best right now. We can just, you know, be with our kids. We don't have to do all of the things. We don't have to, you know, make the birthday super special. We can just enjoy where we are and know that this is a, this time will pass. And then we can, you know, have more energy to make the birthdays or the holidays super special. Um, but right now it is about, you know, how can I get through the day, can continue to develop and build my relationships with my children and ne negotiate with my partner to someone's point earlier about relationships, you know, negotiate with my partner to figure out where we can sort of tag team and help each other. Or if you don't have a partner, you know, finding your social support the outside of your home that can really kind of jump in and help you out when you need it. I think, you know, I think uh, people expected that uh, as, as kids went back to school, a lot of the uh, tension and, and anxiety would be relieved. But in fact, what I'm hearing is a lot more anxiety. Oh my goodness, I'm losing control. My kid is going back to school. I don't know what they're gonna find there. Mm. Are they gonna get mm. sick? Uh, so I, I do think that uh, you know, uh, there's a sense of giving up control uh, right now that, uh, that makes people even more anxious. So I, I really like what uh, Margaret said about you know, easing back into it, being uh, comfortable with yourself, even going into the school, seeing where your kids are going to be back in class, uh, connecting, be, you know, kind of easing back into things, I think is very important. Well, and we do want to acknowledge all the fathers out there too. I know my yeah. husband <laughs> takes on a huge burden since I work nights <laughs> most evenings. So shout out to all the dads who are, you know, working really hard to take care of their professional and family lives. Um, Mark, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can support every member in our family. Yeah, I mean, definitely there's a lot of um, accessible supports these days, virtually. Um, you, you know, there's also phone lines as well. I think there's Parents Anonymous uh, that you could call on a, you know, on an as needed basis. Um, we, we have the California Warm Line uh, as well. That's 24 seven. And these are all peer support programs. So, you know, there's no judgment. Other uh, people are there just to listen. And a lot of these peer lines, not, you know, not necessarily the California Warm Line, but other uh, peer Warm Lines, um, they're, they're just there to listen. A lot of people just need someone to listen to them, acknowledge, other challenges and I think what everybody's saying here is you know be that, that empathetic ear that compassionate ear uh, will help you out and get you that boost and that's what we've been seeing like everyone that's been taking our surveys have said that just by listening uh, they, we've helped out uh, and helped them get through that day so you know there, there's resources out there that I'd recommend people kind of reaching out to they, they don't you know if you can get a therapist by all means please do get a therapist but not everybody's that fortunate uh, not everyone has that privilege and so there are other accessible resources out there. I've been writing down key and points. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Lamar, you get my second key point, lowering expectations. Me getting to work every day is a win. <laughs> yeah. Me getting yes. my kids to school on time-ish is a win. That's every a day. win. It's a lunch. <laughs> yeah, with food. <laughs> so I'm all for that. I, I love that, and I'm keeping that. OK, we're going to turn to some statistics that I'm just gonna be very transparent with you, are somewhat confusing. And this is about 
the most desperate thing that can happen to a person, to a person's family, and that is people who have taken their own lives during this pandemic. And what we know is that the number of suicides amongst children under the age of 18 is up when you compare 2019 to 2020. And you can see the numbers there on your screen, 108 in 2019, 134 in 2020. So that's for young people. But when you look to adults, according to the C CDC, suicides are actually down 5.6%. And I know that there's some disagreement in the, the statistics here because there are people who are saying that when you look overall at several years back, that suicides amongst young people for a number of reasons have been trending up anyway. And so it is, it's hard to say, really, if the pandemic is directly responsible for our numbers last year or if it's just part of a larger trend. But either way, Dr. Butler, we, ob we obviously have to address this because any life loss is a tragedy. And, and so to what do you attribute these rising numbers over the past few years and especially in the past year? I think one, one comment I want to make, the NIH says, and I think this is a, an interesting statistic, kids are 10 times more likely to suicide than to have COVID. When you step back and look at that, how powerful that is. And, and you know, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for kids 10 to 24. And so it's, it's and has been trending up for a number of years. Overall, suicides have been trending up for both adults as well as kids. Uh, our, our suicide rate nationally is at a 30-year high. So this has been going on for a while. Even before uh, COVID, kids were struggling. Um, I, the, there was an interesting study. A, a colleague from uh, San Diego State, Gene Twenge, wrote a really good book looking at this, surveying kids over a number of decades and looking at them snapshots over the decades. And what she found was even before the COVID, kids were not going out as much. Uh, what did you want to do when you turned 16? Well, the first thing I want to do is get a car and drive. The kids now are delaying getting cars. Uh, they're not going to the mall. So this was all before COVID. And uh, uh, I, so we are seeing a continued uh, stress-related problems for kids with COVID, losing the structure, what I call the buffers uh, in life, the sports, the, uh, the structure of school the relationships that you form, all of those help kids, particularly the kids who've had adverse childhood experiences. And I, I don't know that we've talked about that in here, but that's a, an important point. Those are defined as traumatic childhood events before the age of 18, uh, such as a, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And when you're in a household uh, that is struggling related to your parents being unemployed, the kind of tension that goes on in the home uh, and we've seen an increase in domestic violence during this period where people were stuck in the homes. So uh, kids have been under enormous stress and strain even before and now even more so without the structure and, and uh, connections that they've had in, in, in life uh, to help them along. So I, I do think we, we really uh, have our work cut out for us. I'm happy to see that the governor's budget put a lot of money into the school system and, pro and detecting early on kids that are struggling uh, and getting them the kind of care that they need early on. Because uh, I, I, do, I do think we, we really have a, a group of kids now, a cohort of kids that are going to struggle for a number of years. Mm. Dr. Garcia, you, you work with children and families and try and help them through some of the trauma that they've experienced. How concerned are you, um, especially since a lot of them still aren't in full-time school buildings right now and won't be until the fall, how concerned are you that these schools are ready for what these kids are going to be bringing to them? Uh, I have a healthy level of concern, I would say. Uh, I think schools on the whole are trying the best that they can. Uh, you know, schools shut down in person, but they didn't, our teachers never really stopped working. So they've been going this whole entire time um, with virtual virtual school and now they're transitioning as well and they're aware of the mental health issues that kids are potentially bringing back into the school with them as well as the in uh, the, the the multiple uh, places that kids are at in terms of what they've retained 
academically this whole year and the mental health issues that many of them have, I think, suffered from the isolation and um, even pre-existing mental health challenges that they've carried, that's been difficult as well. And so some kids have just dropped out of Zoom classes and um, they're gonna be coming back as well. So everyone's gonna be coming back at different stages, just like we're coming back to work, some of us in different stages in person, so are our kids. And our teachers, our administrators are doing the same thing, coming back in person. So it's gonna be challenging. And I think we're gonna need a lot of support and parents and teachers and the community, they all have to work together and communicate really well about what kids need and what supports they need and to be advocates um, for these kids because they're, they're gonna need a lot of support. I think a lot of kids have been resilient and even those resilient kids are gonna need support to help each other. Absolutely, and I hope to talk more about this, but quickly, what are two things that you can ask your teen if you're concerned about their mental health? Two quick questions or conversation topics. I would say, I, I would say, don't ask them, how are you? You're not going to get an, a good answer. Mm -hmm. Fine. <laughs> Just say, <laughs> yeah, fine. Everything's fine. Um, I would say, I would actually say you want to go for a ride somewhere. Oh. And I would ride in the car. And that's where I would have a conversation with them. And I would say, try to get into their world. Like I've said uh, at other times, what, what are you interested in these days? I would get into their world. And I would not make big questions. And I would say, I've noticed you're, you know, kind of feeling a little blah lately, maybe. Is that, what do you think about that? And you may or may not get an answer, but you've dropped a little piece of, um, a little note in there. And then you can talk about music or talk about what they're interested in. And then maybe they'll get back to you at another point in time in that car ride or in that walk or doing something together um, as you're not looking at each other. I would say. Thank you all so much. Uh, if you or someone you love is struggling with suicidal thoughts, you can find your ally at abc7news.com slash take action. We have links to many vetted resources, and you can also call the National Su Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. Just ahead, some advice from experts who know a little something about living in isolation. We want you to join in the conversation. Go to Facebook or YouTube to weigh in and interact with our panel of experts. Ooh, Dr. Garcia. Again, I wrote down something that you said. Want to go for a ride and not doing something where you have to make direct eye contact with someone. I, I honestly never would have thought of that. Or throw a baseball, you know. <laughs> something active um it's just it's it's rare you know for any of us i think to just sit across the table from each other and just have that serious talk it's a lot of pressure and for teens it's even more so you know for so, kids, yeah right particularly for kids <laughs> i mean maybe you'll have a kid who actually really answers you when you say how are you but it's it's not the norm i would say yeah it's something that I've been thinking about recently, uh, I saw an article that was done, I think it was the University of Manitoba, and they were talking about a mental health vaccine. So obviously not a literal syringe that goes into your brain, but they were, they were talking about what would that look like to use the same framework of distribution of vaccine, but in a mental health capacity. So this is for anyone. What would you include in a mental health vaccine so that the most people could benefit for the least amount of money? This oh, is like the I'll magic wand in. question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was about <laughs> to say the magic same thing. Wand. Yeah, like what could we do? I, I think for myself, what comes to mind in terms of how often the conversation about mental health, it sounds like an individual problem. So if you're depressed or you're anxious, it's something within yourself, right? And yes, that's true in the case of the biochemical changes that are associated with that. But I think when we talk about a mental health vaccine, this aspirational idea, what can really contribute to that is systemic change, right? We talked about police mm -hmm. brutality earlier. 
we're talking about the violence against Asian Americans. So when we're talking about what a vaccine would look like, I think it would include justice, right? It would include equity and this idea that the systemic processes that are around us are what contribute to these mental health concerns. It's not just something that lies within the individual. I'd put yeah, some I'd love, just... some love into that that vaccine. Oh, I, I, you know, I I, I think that uh, uh, having one person who cares about you and loves you makes all the difference in the world for kids and for adults growing up. Uh, it just uh, enormous. One person on your side that you feel that you can trust makes a huge difference in life. So I do think I'd put I put someone who loves you in the in the vaccine. Thirty seconds. It's all about yeah. the relationship. Mm -hmm. The relationship and, and also resilience, mm -hmm. I would say. Community resilience and individual resilience, you know, and, and yes, justice, because a lot of, of the issues stem out of inequity. That's and, right. Um, when we're yeah. talking about pandemic um, impact, seconds. those who have been most impacted are those who have the least, I think, who've yeah. had to go into work, our essential workers, our single parents, and all of these okay, different things that we're don't allow them. Okay, we're going to get back to the on-air okay. stuff in just a second. So we'll come back to this. Just need to remember that we are adaptable and we will go to a different kind of normal again. But you don't want to throw yourself at it too hard. Allow the change to happen gradually. Just recognizing that everybody is going to have a different reaction and many of those reactions are going to be unexpected. Unexpected to the world and unexpected to those people themselves. How am I going to take this new version of me and introduce it to this new version of the world in as productive way as I possibly can? Certainly in the, in the weeks and the, and the months ahead, um, you know, I, I think we should err towards uh, forgiveness. There's going to be a lot of awkward encounters for everybody. Okay, those are people who are literally in isolation for various reasons, some of them in space and didn't have a whole lot of people to talk to. And now all of us on Earth know what that's like after a year plus of being primarily amongst just a couple of people. So some advice about how to return to the normal when isolation is over. Absolutely, and we do want to get back to our panel to find out what they think. What do you do if you know that someone is struggling, Dr. Um, but Lair, what do you think? Well, you know, I think people have to recognize uh, when when their uh, struggle is, is somewhat normal and when it's not. So, you know, people who are are not sleeping well, who are uh, losing joy in life, who are losing their energy, uh, uh, and uh, what we call anhedonia, just the pleasure in life is is gone. Those are people who really need to, uh, I think, uh, seek help. Uh, uh, and I, I do think that mental health uh, treatment uh, and reaching out for, for some support is very important. Um, it's not sometimes it's not enough to talk to uh, to talk to your neighbors or to talk to people who you care about. Sometimes it's important to talk to to uh, professionals. You know, I, I'm so happy that you mentioned uh, the isolation because in isolation too is comes strength which is a lot of people have really reorganized their lives, what's important to them, what's most meaningful in their lives. This has given people an opportunity. And sometimes that's not so comfortable. So we need to really uh, work that through. So I do think that uh, reaching out uh, is important to both friends, but also if you need some professional help and you're starting to feel very anxious, very depressed, I do think that there's a lot of resources and services in the community uh, to welcome you and to help you through a, a, this period of your life. Well, but we all know mental health resources are scarce. Dr. Garcia, I know that you and I have spoken about just this problem. Someone may want to seek a therapist, but they don't know how or they can't get access. Uh, Mark, what are you hearing um, is the best way or what are you hearing from community about successful ways to access that care? Yeah, I mean, for our community, the the easiest way is just a referral from someone you know, right? Because then, you, you know, it's word of mouth. It's someone you trust. And I, I think when therapists or, or, you know, specialists talk about mental health, they have to make it accessible in terms of language uh, and, and usability. Uh, and I think a lot of the, the people we talk about, 
you know, telemedicine, tele like therapy, a lot of people don't have access to that as well. So, you know, it's, it's always looking for the easiest, uh, and uh, easiest way for people to get mental health support. And for us, I mean, one of the easiest ways is, is just picking up a phone call, uh, our California warm line, again, our California warm line is, is 24 seven. Um, you can call in any time. It's a peer who's gone, you know, who's trained in counseling, uh, and they've gone to the same exact experience as you. And we found that when someone discloses that they have gone through the same struggle, more people tend to open up about their own struggle and they recognize it within themselves or they recognize it in others uh, about their own challenges. And, and so they, they tend to reach out more. And at that point, it's then when we encourage them to look uh, for higher level support or higher level therapy or services you know, from these great uh, uh, psychologists and therapists that we have on, on the panel today. So it, it's, you know, it's always looking for the quickest and easiest way first um, and then you kind of graduate up to to services that if you feel like uh, you need you know there, there's a lot of therapists out there okay. you made a good point about uh, the shortage of behavioral health uh, practitioners in the community and I think that's why a lot of apps have, have actually been put out that are doing a really nice job a couple of apps like calm and my strength and a lot of people have been struggling with weight uh, the new map uh, so I think that there are a, a number of ways to access help that may not necessarily be psychotherapy, but other forms of, of, of uh, care that I think people have been uh, reaching out to that, that's been uh, very, very supportive to a number of people. And then there are also Can I just other... quickly chime in on oh. that one, sir? Um, so we, we partner with Headspace as a part of public that's health right. in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, we're given out. 10,000 like professional licenses. So check out our website, mentalhealthsf.org. You get free access to an app for a year. Uh, it helps with sleep, uh, you know, meditation and all that stuff. So just a, a plug for free services for a free app. Oh, hey, <laughs> was, uh, I'm into that. There are <laughs> other ways to access, because there's, there's multiple challenges with accessing mental health resources. It may be a financial barrier for folks. In that case, you can, you know, touch base with your insurance carrier or, um, you know, there's, but there are other low cost ways, because even if you try to get in with a, with an, with a counselor, many of them have wait lists yes. because there's so many people who've accessed mental health over the counselors and therapists over the last year. Um, and so there's other ways to think about that. You know, um, if your kid is in school, there's a school counselor there that they can touch base with and get some support. Um, you know, I am at Palo Alto university. We're graduating 200 counselors and therapists and psychologists a year. And those folks are all working in a clinic on our campus. So finding a, a university counseling or psychology program that has students in training is a great way to mm -hmm. access low cost therapy from people who are you know, trained and they're being supervised by licensed folks. Um, it's a great way to, to, another way to think about how to access some mental health care if you're not able to get it out in the community in more traditional ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, I wanted to ask Dr. Saunders that, I mean, she is a therapist and I, I'm curious, the people who are coming to you seeking professional help, how are they paying for this generally? So I'm private pay, so folks who come to see me are paying out of pocket. Um, and a lot of the times it's because they either want to work with me or another provider specifically who is a black woman. So because there's been an increase in folks who are looking for someone who understands and can empathize with their experience, they're wanting someone who looks like them. And so oftentimes they have found me through a directory or one of their uh, a word of mouth referral from someone that they are close with and so the referrals come that way and what is a good thing is that a lot of therapists offer sliding scale fees so you can inquire about those openings too because part of the i think another barrier to accessing mental health care is the stigma in a lot of communities, there's stigma related to even talking about whatever is happening with you or in your family because that's against the rules, right? It's a violation mm -hmm. to talk about what's happening in your personal life with someone outside of your family. And so I'm happy that people are feeling more comfortable to reach out and also to feel empowered to look for a therapist who gets them. 
Dr. Saunders, I'm so I also, glad you brought oh. up stigma. Um, Dr. Garcia, you'll be great to answer this too though. Amanda <laughs> wants to know, a viewer says, how can you help someone who's skeptical about seeking mental health services? So if you know someone who needs help, but they're just not there because of stigma or for whatever reason, uh, Dr. Garcia, what do you think? I was, uh, it's funny that question came up because I was going to say for someone who's hesitant or for a family who's hesitant, I would even tell them you can just call to consult. So for example, um, in uh, at Edgewood, we have a crisis stabilization unit and I often tell people you don't have to be in crisis actually. Families can just call our crisis stabilization unit and get consultation on what sort of issues they're facing with their kid and with their family right then and there, and they will talk to you. And so I give that advice to people is just because you're calling a therapist, you're calling a warm line, you're calling some mental health professional, you're texting crisis text line, it doesn't mean you're entering into this relationship that will uh, be forever, because that can be a lot of pressure on someone. You can just make one phone call or one text and just find out what it's about and ask your questions, ask a lot of questions and, and just think of it as, as a consultation, you know, and, and that's one way to do it. And then another way is to also join some peer support groups on Facebook or whatever social media you might be on that's well reviewed and, and see what people there are doing. And that can often lead to professional help as well. So some of those things is taking little bites rather than thinking about it as a big bite. And if you're talking to a friend about it, just say, why don't you just call and ask some questions? And then you can always hang up. I'm going gonna, gonna to no jump gonna in. Know. Dr. Garcia, thank you so much. We are going to take a quick break on air, but the conversation is going to continue right now on Facebook and YouTube. And then we'll be back on TV in a few. Part of our commitment to helping build a better Bay Area is focusing on your health and well-being. And while we don't have all the answers, we certainly have some resources that you can take a look at that are vetted and local. Just go to abc7news.com slash take action. Mark Salazar, I'm dumb. What is a warm line? <laughs> line is not necessarily a hotline. So we, we, we always liken it to to like a pot of boiling water, right? You wanna prevent that water from boiling over uh, and, and spilling. So what we do in our warm line is try to prevent that. And so it's pre-crisis uh, peer support. Um, so it helps you kind of manage your day or whatever it is a week. Uh, and then, you know, like, like I said earlier, we, you know, our, our counselors will talk to you and see if you need higher levels of, of therapy or treatment and we'll make those recommendations. So a warm line is preventative. And I think that's what we should, we talked about, about the, the magic wand earlier <laughs> for a vaccine or mental health. It, it's this preventative approaches. If we invest more into systematic prevention, uh, and providing that kind of accessible supporting care. I think, you know, uh, mental health wouldn't be such a big issue at this stage. And we have at MHASF this program called Redefining Crazy. It's the system and not the people. And that's exactly what we believe. We have mm -hmm. to transform this entire system to put wellness and, and people right at the center. Uh, and that means balancing everything in their life, work, finances, housing, food, every insecurity, every injustice should be centered uh, and you work around that as that system, not this, I need, you know, this capitalistic system of, of needs and demand. It's, it's, it should be equitable. It should be accessible to everyone. But my long-winded answer, oh, yeah, warm line is very peer-centered, peer non-judgmental support. Uh, as Dr. Garcia said earlier, you don't have to commit to anything. It's it's a 15 to 30 minute call and you can hang up at the end of the day and never call back. Yeah, she said you can hang up. That was my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> too yeah especially yeah. for teens who may not be comfortable picking up the phone they have access to text lines where they might be more comfortable texting with someone and it's it's lower mm. risk than maybe picking up the phone and talking directly to someone Ooh. well there's also and, chats and, online too mm -hmm. and dr mm -hmm. lamar i'm just thinking of young people who have had a hard time if they're feeling a little lost it seems like there's a bright future in mental health care and counseling is is this a career yes. path you recommend high school and college yes. students start considering 
Absolutely. I was actually, uh, uh, Dr. Saunders, was, when she was talking, I was thinking, gosh, we talk all the time about how we need more counselors of color um, because there's communities in need and and that, you know, we're really always looking for students who are in, from different communities that are looking to go back and serve their own communities. And so um, there's a lot of uh, potential. It's one of the, if you look at the government career website, it's one of the like bright oh, outlook, gosh. counselors, therapists, mm -hmm. and psychologists. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, of great career opportunities in our, in the field. So yeah, it's exciting. Plus you can be on ABC seven news. <laughs> I mean, we can have our next panel with, <laughs> with some new recruits. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we have about 15 seconds before we come back for our last segment. Uh, but if I don't get a chance to tell you, I just want to thank every one of you on our panel. Yes. Thank uh, you. You've been so informative and, um, Thank you. Thank you. The results of this year will be felt for decades. For kids, families, husbands, wives, everybody. We're gonna hurt. We're gonna hurt together. After years of being in the shadows, finally discussions about mental health are coming out into the open. Oprah and Prince Harry have a new docu-series about mental health where people like Lady Gaga, Glenn Close are sharing their struggles. And we also, of course, want to thank you, thank you, thank you to our panel of experts for taking time out of all of your very busy schedules today to talk with us, with all of us, about your mental health, all of our mental health. And they are Dr. Stuart Butler with Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Christine Garcia with Edgewood Center, Dr. Margaret Lamar from Palo Alto University, psychologist Dr. Nia Saunders, and Mark Salazar with the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. So final thoughts, I was speaking with a wonderful Bay Area psychologist this week who is an expert on compassion focused therapy. I asked him if there's a way that we can all support to work, work to support each other's mental health. And he said unequivocally yes, and suggests that people take small steps towards sharing vulnerabilities with their colleagues and community. He said not to unload a lifetime of anxiety on your boss or coworker all at once, but to let someone know if you're feeling nervous or awkward as you head back to the office or an in-person activity, or if you're feeling down as you deal with something difficult in your life, let someone know. He said in return, you're gonna realize that that person understands and may actually be dealing with something similar. So instead of feeling lonely and disconnected from others, you get to share an empathy and connect with people. I think that we can all go a long way towards making each other's days a little easier by showing up with compassion and kindness. Thank you, Kate. Months ago, my right arm really hurt, and I thought that time alone would heal it. It didn't, it just got worse. <laughs> I saw my doctor, he got me to physical therapy, and now we're gonna do some imaging, I guess. I don't know how this story ends, but I am hopeful I will regain full use of my arm and my shoulder. Now, it is not easy to get my shoulder back in business. It's time consuming, it's painful, but it was really easy to get help. One message to my doctor on an app on my phone got the ball rolling. Now, there's no difference between my shoulder's health and my mental health. It's just another part of my body. But have you tried getting mental health treatment? Oof, it is not just a message on your app to a doctor. It can be a maze of no's before you reach a yes. And by that time, a lot of us just give up. That is the system's fault. That is not your fault. And I'm sorry that you have to fight to get help for what should just be automatic. So I say start actively mentioning mental health to your friends, to your family, to your employers. The more we talk about mental health like it's as normal as a shoulder injury, the more we may finally treat it that way. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> Great storytelling as always from Reggie Aki. And if you missed to some of today's conversation, you can watch it all over again on our connected TV apps on Roku, Apple TV, Fire TV, and Android TV. Search ABC7 Bay Area to download it now. And we want to remind you that if you or someone you love is struggling with suicidal thoughts, you can find your ally at abc7news.com slash take action. We have links to vetted resources. You can also call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. So Thank I wrote down these, these things <laughs> that meant a lot to me today. Dr. Lamar, lowering your expectations, right, of you and others. Dr. Christine Garcia, Ask your kids, do you want to go for a ride? Make it non-confrontational. 
You don't have to stare at each other. Go for a ride and talk about stuff. What did you get out of this? Take it easy, give yourself grace, and thank you all so much for joining us for this special edition of ABC 7 News at 4.